Good afternoon. Uh, uh, welcome to our last discussion before the uh, uh, vacation. And uh, we are starting the whole series of discussions on uh, decision making in Russia. And the reason why uh, we are focused on decision making is not only connected with the fact that uh, it would be good to uh, know what uh, uh, do we need to foresee next. But uh, there is another reason as well. Uh, in case of uh, closed uh, authoritarian political regimes, uh, which uh, in many ways uh, uh, look uh, like black boxes, it's not that easy to understand uh, how they are designed and how they do function. And when uh, describing traditional uh, elements like political parties, elections, and everything else, uh, we are not coming closer to understanding the essence of these regimes. That's why it's so important to focus on functioning and decision-making is the best way to learn more about uh, uh, any political regime, Russia uh, included, uh, and to look at uh, its evolution. And here we came with uh, uh, large-scale international projects where both of our presenters do uh, participate, uh, which is aimed uh, to learn more about decision making uh, in uh, present day uh, Russia and uh, what uh, has changed and uh, what should be weighed in uh, near future. We did choose two uh, very important and interesting spheres to discuss today. One is internet, which is uh, expanding and uh, which is a way to learn much more about the evolution of decision-making in case uh, the new subject is appearing. And uh, foreign policy, which is of course uh, interesting to, uh, well, uh, majority of uh, our listeners, of our participants. And we're lucky to have two uh, profound speakers today. Uh, Tatiana, uh, Tanya Lockett uh, is associate professor at uh, uh, Dublin City uh, University, and she did publish recently a uh, very uh, interesting book on her subject, and internet is uh, her major focus, and uh, Pavel Baev works for a uh, couple of decades now at uh, the uh, Peace Research Institute in Oslo, and is well known perhaps to, to all of you. So with saying this, I like not to waste more time. Uh, just uh, to uh, say a few words about technicalities. Uh, first is that uh, we're uh, recorded. And uh, uh, second, uh, you may uh, ask your questions using uh, either raise hand uh, functions, uh, function uh, or uh, write something into chat. So we do plan to have 10 to 15 minutes, uh, well, introductory presentation from each of our participants, and then we'll switch to uh, Q&A and uh, discussions. So uh, let me ask uh, Tanya to be, the, uh, to be the first and to take the lead. Tanya, the floor is yours. So I'm going to take the next, hopefully, 15 minutes or so to um, just briefly talk about um, how the internet has evolved in Russia as, as an object of strategic interest and, and how decision making about the internet has, um, has also evolved um, over the past two decades or so. Um, so, of course, uh, decision making is, um, you know, a very complex subject. And um, as we've sort of identified in our conversations in uh, the project so far, um, there are higher level and lower level decisions. And sometimes higher level decisions aren't necessarily even decisions. They're sort of meta frames that are established quite early on by key actors or key <clears throat> key groups of, of actors um, that set the direction in which all decisions going forward are made. But those frames, of course, are also prone to changing. Uh, so we have multiple subjects and decisions branching out from those meta frames. And it's also really important to understand who are the actors and coalitions who are involved in making those decisions and building those, those frames and strategies. And also to see which frames and strategies remain stable um, and when they change why they change um, or how they change over time. And for the internet especially, it's been really interesting to see 
the kind of shifting spheres of influence, control and decision making, uh, where it's gone from being one thing to, to being quite a different thing and uh, gaining uh, really huge interest with groups that weren't initially interested in it at all. Um, and that might help us understand how those meta frames and decisions uh, shape long term politics and, and how change uh, happens. So, as I said, the Internet in Russia has been this evolving object of interest. Um, and it kind of became this hybrid uh, object because it first became an object of strategic interest, primarily in the media and information space. Uh, which, you know, it, this was where uh, there were lots of experiments by national and international media and independent media and state-owned media. And then it turned into more of an object of economic and financial interest with the growth of digital technological innovation, uh, with the importance of data uh, to financial systems uh, being connected to the global networks. And then it shifted to being a space of public opinion, political activity. Um, therefore, it also became important to, um, to the state to co-opt this space as part of the broader push for control of political elites and public perceptions. And in more recent times, you've seen the internet gain importance as a geopolitical strategic object and also as an object of conspiratorial interest uh, because it's been central to a number of conflicts, uh, to an ongoing cyberware, a cyber warfare push and pull between Russia and other states and also foreign policy operations, including influence operations. And um, in the current and ongoing stage, the internet is now also seen as an important object of critical technological infrastructure. So it's not just about information warfare, it's also about national security, um, preserving stability in terms of infrastructural security. So um, this part of the internet is now also being co-opted into full, uh, full state control. Um, and this, this hybridity really um, aligns quite well with what we know about um, what scholars of the internet in Russia term networked authoritarianism, uh, which um, is when a state combines a keen interest and investment in technological developments, uh, but at the same time, it also seeks to reinforce state control over infrastructure, financial flows, content, and speech online. So this is, this is where we sort of uh, find ourselves at present. Um, and so some of the key trends over time um, in terms of governance and control of the internet, we've seen uh, the internet in Russia go from little or no state control uh, to selective control of content, to control over key digital media and platforms that the state saw as important, to then almost total control of content and user activity data, to then control of infrastructure and technical protocols, which is now uh, taking shape as part of Russia's internet sovereignty strategy. In terms of economic and financial development, we've also seen um, you know, the, the primarily business-oriented uh, in, in, interest in the internet and kind of as a sphere of investment, as a sphere of technological excellence, to then be influenced by uh, the understanding that there were also political dividends to be gained from internet control. And then a national security and geopolitical interests came into play. And so now the internet is, is very much seen as the sphere of cybersecurity, um, national security, and that is fighting uh, against um, the push for uh, continued economic gains and for the continued investment in joint infrastructure. And of course, in terms of the media, politics, and civics, the, you know, we, we first thought of RUNET as a media sphere where there were lots of exciting um, experiments, uh, which were mostly free and very uh, ungoverned. Uh, and then we went to RUNET and internet technologies becoming uh, seen by the state as drivers of political agency. Um, so they became tools of geopolitical influence and therefore it became quite necessary to, to co-opt and control them uh, because the internet also gained this sort of conspiratorial significance because it was seen as there's more, there's more to it than meets the eye and there are certain um, influences and actors in play um, that you know, aren't necessarily obviously um, obvious to, um, to the naked eye. Um, so in terms of the key periods uh, so far, we've seen this idea that in the first um, eight years or so between 2000 and 2008, uh, there was mostly a pragmatic sort of market driven nationalist approach to the Russian internet segment and the control was quite selective. So this was uh, very much in line with um, kind of a broader uh, policy of 
developing uh, Russia as a great nation um, and, you know, establishing control over the media space, but not necessarily the Internet, because it was still in the very early stages of becoming a, a full, fully a part of, of uh, the media space, which was the state was really interested in controlling. So the Internet remained mostly private and mostly owned by private companies and the infrastructure and the, the websites and the key platforms were mostly privately owned. Since 2008 uh, and to about 2012, um, Russia entered this um, new um, era of kind of, uh, well, first of all, Dmitry Medvedev briefly replaced Vladimir Putin at the helm, and he showed um, very much um, an interest in technological progress. Um, he himself really was interested in building out this uh, digital services, e-governance. Um, and so we see in this era um, also the geopolitical confrontation with the West that begins in the post-Soviet space, but at the same time, uh, some renovations in how the Russian internet is governed. Some of the regulators are updated. Um, Roskomnadzor uh, gets new powers, but there are still few specific decisions beyond that. And there's quite a stable period of, of internet governance, but also growing anti-Western activity in post-Soviet space and the uh, beginnings of sort of proper cyber warfare as we know them. And then since 2012, and especially since um, the wave of protests, um, including the Arab Spring, Euromaidan, and the Bolotnaya protests in Russia, which were seen as aided, if not uh, enabled by um, the digital technologies, we see a period of really full-fledged networked authoritarianism come into play where um, key meta decisions are reconfigured. And a key pivot is that the state becomes really interested in um, consolidating state control over, over the internet. And there are multiple decisions made in this area. So there's lots of legislative activity, repressive activities, uh, military activity. There's uh, lots of changes of ownership in key um, digital companies uh, and key companies connected to all the different spheres. And then at the same time, there's also continued investment into technological development and digital infrastructure. So internet penetration grows very quickly in the country, but at the same time, we have developments in the SORM uh, equipment that is installed for state surveillance purposes. Uh, we also see development of um, deep packet inspection technologies and um, a massive push for uh, facial recognition to be used in conjunction with the CCTV networks in the country. Uh, so this, in, this is internal. At the same time, there's a greater focus on geopolitics and conspiracy theories, as well as on national counter elites. And all of this kind of comes together, um, really has come together in the past several years. So what we are seeing now is that the state is very much constructing the foundation for a new internet strategy and a new politics of influence online as part of the national security and information security doctrine, which were both fairly recently updated, the national security one quite recently, literally this week. Um, so uh, again, as I said, because the internet has changed in um, as, a, as an object of interest, it also means there's a broad cross-section of different actors who at various times were or are involved in making or influencing decisions about it. Um, and some actors, obviously, you know, we have the, the various uh, state actors, such as the president and people in the presidential administration close to him, um, the government, various ministries, and not just the Profilnaya ministries of digital development, but also uh, finance ministry and other ministries. Um, obviously, the Parliamentary Committee on Information Policy and Information Technologies, uh, with some key lawmakers who have authored the most uh, laws related to internet governance. And then, of course, the seal of the key, so the various parts of the security apparatus and the intelligence uh, apparatus. Um, and then also, there are obviously a number of corporate actors state corporations, private corporations, and specific people um, who have owned different kinds of media, pl um, internet platforms and social media platforms at various times, and then also a number of non-state actors, both pro-government and anti-government. Um, and so it's really interesting that if we look at the top, uh, some of the leaders in terms of decision-making, like Vladimir Putin himself, have publicly distanced themselves from internet-related decisions. And, you know, because he's saying, well, I don't really use the internet and I don't know how it works. I get printouts of everything. Whereas Dmitry Medvedev actually publicly embraced being digitally savvy and, you know, uh, being on Twitter and such. But in recent years, we've seen that gradually change. And even Putin himself has spoken more and more often about internet-related issues. Uh, showing that he is very much part of this kind of growing conspiratorial interest in the internet as a CIA project, and um, to quote him verbatim, 
Uh, for instance, in his recent direct line Q&A with the public, he referred to Telegram's ban and said that the state was negotiating with Telegram, whatever that means, whereas Telegram, of course, has denied that uh, there were any negotiations. So over time, decisions about the Russian internet have come to encompass everything from media and free expression to data protection, content moderation, and now to the infrastructural issues such as the domain name system and control over that uh, and traffic exchange points. And as a result of this somewhat chaotic governance regime where different actors jump in at different points when they realize that the internet is of interest to them, decision-making about the internet has also been somewhat chaotic and disorganized. And this has meant that many of the norms and legislation related to support these decisions made about the internet contain provisions that are hard to implement and enforce in practice. Sometimes, you know, you pass um, a law where the law says <clears throat> certain actors should do something like all ISPs should install this new uh, deep packet inspection um, equipment, but the ISPs don't have any money to do that. And so it's really not clear how exactly they're expected to do it. Another example of this is the Yarvai law that relates to anti-extremist activity and that requires social media platforms and internet companies to store user data and metadata uh, for a period of from six months to three years. Again, huge costs are involved. It's not particularly clear how exactly um, the, the company should do this. Uh, so very often we have these sort of um, gaps between what, what the decisions uh, suggest and how they're actually implemented or not implemented in practice. Um, and we can see um, elite coalitions uh, emerging, but also broader coalitions. So elite coalitions, such as, you know, those who are interested in national security or specific business interests, uh, which particular um, people seek to promote uh, in Russia, but also coalitions around issues such as digital rights or e-governance or business development, so industry bodies. Um, these coalitions also shape and guide decision-making uh, and can often collaborate with certain veto players who might say, push back a particular set of legislative amendments because it doesn't align with their interests. And for instance, this, this um, happened with the internet sovereignty legislation, which I'll talk about in just a second. So there, there is um, this kind of ongoing and quite, I would say, um, this environment where, where things are pushed back or pushed forward depending on uh, particular interests uh, that emerge at particular moments. Um, and so well, if we look at some of the key frames that have guided um, how decisions are made about the internet, of course, these frames have also shifted and changed. Um, but uh, we can say that, you know, uh, since the beginning of, of Vladimir Putin's rule, um, there has been a concerted attempt to create and develop um, information security and national security doctrines. Uh, but the internet was um, featured only in a limited way in their early versions, whereas in their more recent uh, revisions, uh, the inter information security doctrine was revised in 2016 and the national security doctrine was revised just, just recently. There is a much greater focus on the internet as a key component of information security and national security. At the same time, you know, even though uh, many, um, in, if, if you look at some of the media coverage, it seems like internet sovereignty is a recent thing that emerged just a few years ago. It's actually part of this broader frame of sovereignization and closing Russia to the West that began in, again, in the early 2000s and was has really been ramping up since 2008. Um, at the same time, state monopolization of the media sphere, again, as soon as the internet became a really prominent player in the media sphere, it, it entered that frame of, of state monopolization. And then of course, you know, con the, con the confrontation with the West and um, increasing repressions of political elites. And then that has all kind of led to a concerted effort to establish control over the internet where it started to be really visible that there was a concerted effort on the part of different actors to work together to establish control over the internet in terms of content, in terms of influence, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of economic interests. Um, so all of this is um, is currently kind of really has is reaching its peak, and we can see we can see it in the news headlines. Um, at the same time, because of the hybrid nature of the internet, right, um, certain decisions will often. Uh, branch out from multiple frames, right? So for instance, the situation with the blocking of Telegram or with the attempted blocking of Telegram in um, 2018 um, can be seen as part of a broader push to sanction or to limit the um, activity of social media platforms. 
Um, but because these decisions are cross-sectoral, uh, some actors make this decision. So Roskomnadzor made the decision to block Telegram and actually faced significant criticism from many other um, state actors um, who weren't happy with the way the situation was handled. Um, in the same way, uh, the sovereign internet legislation was a project that was in development much earlier than the usual frame of 2017, 2019 that we come to think about, um, but it was pushed back uh, because the initial versions of the draft bill on internet sovereignty or the draft amendments didn't satisfy all of the players who had a particular interest um, in, in establishing a particular version of internet sovereignty in Russia. Um, and so we can see that while the internet related uh, decision making uh, in the early 2000s, focused on creating institutions such as Roskomnadzor and the Ministry of uh, <clears throat> Digital Development, and you know, placing these into broader strategies or doctrines. Since the 2010 um, and 2012, in particular, we've seen a shift in focused to legislative activity and the creation of a profound normative shift in how the internet is governed, as well as the targeting of specific actors, specific individuals, platforms, or organizations as part of the takeover of the internet by the state. So we've seen changes in ownership, economic sanctions, legal pressure, persecution, uh, shutting down websites, um, and um, everything, um, everything within that frame. So a good example of a crossover decision that builds on previous meta decisions and sub decisions uh, is, is the uh, internet sovereignty legislation. And at this advanced stage, it, it obviously encompasses multiple spheres and requires in, input from multiple actors. Um, but it started, <clears throat> pardon me, back in 2014 when the National Security Council first discussed at one of its sessions the security of the Russian internet and threats of disconnection from abroad. Um, and this came after the Ministry of Communications did some run some tests that showed that the RUNET was vulnerable potentially to external. Uh, attacks. This is the same year that the data localization law was passed, which mandates that uh, Russian users' data must be stored on servers inside Russia. So we see these early precursors of sovereignty emerging even then. And then in 2016, we also had the Yaravai law, which uh, in, in kind of made the internet mainstream in um, anti-extremist efforts. And it gave law enforcement a lot of different tools <clears throat> to control what was happening online. Um, the initial version of the Internet Sovereignty Bill was presented in November 2016, and it met with extensive criticism from IT experts and ministries of finance and economic development, so it didn't even make it into the Duma. Um, but then, in um, since then, and up until November 2017, uh, there were frequent reports from the security services and Rostelecom, the state-owned provider, that they have had foiled a number of Western cyber attacks on Russian financial systems. So clearly there was still extensive interest in passing and implementing legislation that would uh, cr create a more sovereign RUNET. So then in November, 2017, the National Security Council got an order from Putin and Patrushev, and it asked the Ministry of Communications to develop a new draft bill and that work was headed by the Deputy Minister Sokolov, who is himself ex-FSB. Um, so again, there was a lot of pushback from industry and IT experts who were really concerned with the centralization of internet infrastructure and thought that it actually made the systems more vulnerable. And nonetheless, we had that. We had the backfired attempt to block Telegram. And um, in 2019, uh, we also had, again, another wave of mass protests. So in December, 2018, the new draft bill went to parliament, um, passes all sorts of expert analysis, gets some amendments, uh, but is seen as timely, and therefore it's supported uh, by a cross coalition of different uh, government actors. Um, and um, it passes first, second, and third reading in April 2019, when it's approved by the council and signed by Putin. And in November 2019, it comes into force. Um, so you can see how different actors become involved in a particular decision at different points when their interests are targeted or when their interests um, are under threat. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there is a, a clear kind of um, set of reasons behind why the, in, the why we now have a sovereign internet um, 
sort of uh, set of laws and why we now are implementing all of these aspects, even if uh, not necessarily all of the um, ISPs are implementing them uh, with equal vigor because some of them just don't have the, fund the funding to install uh, the required equipment. But we've also seen new laws uh, passed since 2019, um, more amendments regulating various aspects of the sovereign internet um, and also other regulations mandating um, how in foreign entities must operate if they want to keep working on the Russian internet. So there's a number of key tenets of the sovereign runet, um, which extend again to all sorts of different uh, spheres, not just control over data and not co just content, but also anonymity and privacy, restrictions on foreign funding, um, control over key infrastructure. So that it, it really is an all encompassing law. And so, in conclusion, what I'll say is that the internet at this point in time, both as a public space and a technical in, and as technical infrastructure is finally seen by the Russian state as a sphere of strategic priority in all its guises and is therefore imperative to control all of its aspects. Um, what we've seen uh, is a gradual takeover of key industry players, crackdowns on political elites and active users, amid a shift to conspiratorial thinking, uh, which also um, was the reason for the swathe of new regulations all aimed at consolidating state control. Um, we could, we've seen an, an increase in the number of decisions made over time, and we've seen this key pivot or change in the more strategic approach in 2012-2013 to gain broader influence across all facets of the internet, perhaps even extending beyond the Russian internet segment. And we, what we're also seeing is this growing involvement of intelligence and security actors and, um, or coalitions and also the, um, the centrality of foreign policy and geopolitical considerations when it comes to the internet. Um, but it's interesting that these are increasingly clashing with technocratic business and economic development interests. Um, and um, these clashes also influence how quickly and in what manner decisions are made at the top. I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. And uh, I am sure you'll get a lot of questions, but now let's switch to Pavel and uh, uh, his presentation on foreign policy decisions. Please, Pavel. Very good, very good. All right, uh, let me say I'm very glad to be a part of this discussion. And I hope after the summer break, we will be all happy on learning everything we know about Zoom. Uh, it will be real meetings. And I'm also very glad to be a part of this project, uh, which is a kind of brainchild and designed very much by Nikolai Petrov. And when he just forwarded the idea, I immediately was taken seeing there is something in that approach, which makes it possible to mine some new value and to add it to the uh, grow, ever growing uh, volume of research on Russian foreign policy in, in particular, and other aspects of Russian policy, certainly. Uh, the immediately obvious problem for me was that, well, we know so little about how decisions are made uh, in, the, in the foreign policy in particular, extremely closed, very hermetic area, uh, really hard to say what is discussed in what format, who, who are going to be the parties to this discussion, uh, how the choices are made. So the only way uh, for me to go was to compile a different data, not the kind of primary interviews, not the, uh, not the rumors, but a sort of meaningful list of decisions in the foreign policy area over the 20 plus years of Putin's reign and to see where that list uh, will, will take me. Uh, and again, compiling this list is uh, several key limitations were necessary to, uh, to make. And one of them uh, was how to separate decisions from say events. For instance, the summit with Trump in Helsinki was a, it was a big thing. Uh, it's not exactly a decision uh, in event probably I'm not sure about how to put about the summit in Geneva, but again, my data stops at the year 2020, uh, the end of 2020. If we will decide to, uh, to stretch it further, I will make the uh, proper decisions. So events is, 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 a, is a separate story, and I am really trying to focus on uh, decisions which typically involves making choices. And here, Again, another uh, 
major limitation is that we only know about the choices, so to say, in the affirmative, when the decision was uh, made to do something, to go for something, uh, and not to abstain. Uh, so, uh, in the choice of whether well, choices to do or not to do, it's a decision anyhow. But uh, only the affirmative decisions, so to say, are in the list, and probably one uh, of the decisions about not to do something, which I have still included, is a decision uh, not to try to interfere, to impact, to influence the course of the revolution in Armenia. Uh, quite obviously, all sorts of opportunities were there. I'm not saying by speaking about military intervention. Interventions are overall different, uh, different story, but it, there were all sorts of instruments available for uh, for Putin to interfere in that, and it, uh, the decision wasn't done. Uh, and there is a, probably a separate list necessary for such decisions. I included only this one only for an example. And the third uh, limitation, so to say, to that approach is that how to define foreign policy. Uh, because, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a broad area we, which we all generally understand. But for that matter, the most useful instrument, the instrument of choice now in foreign policy matters is the military force. Uh, and those decisions are examined separately. There is a different chapter uh, by uh, Dima Gorenburg, uh, who is probably part of the discussion. So I am stay, staying away from that. It is a bit of a s artificial separation, so to say, uh, foreign policy kind of not in the, in the military area. Nevertheless, with these limitations, I compiled a list of 49 cases over the 20 years. My initial uh, intention was to limit to one case a year, and I, then I saw it's becoming too, uh, too limited. No more than three, I decided, uh, finally. And so the list is 49, is, which is generally manageable, something to work on. It is very much a work in progress. I don't have as yet uh, firm conclusions. I don't have, uh, that's why uh, no uh, uh, presentation in the form of slides and pictures. I just want to discuss what I, uh, where I am at the moment, what is, uh, what is coming so far. And I will give you three very particular features about foreign policy and three uh, um, uh, findings, so to say, uh, on this list. Uh, because foreign policy in many ways turns out to be significantly different from other decisions in other areas, being that kind of regional, being that military, being that economic policy. There are unique features to the foreign policy, and one of them is what I say, slow start. In many areas, uh, including even such a dynamic area as internet, about which Tanya was just speaking, it is possible to find a very strong beginning already in the year 2020 where some kind of decisions, principal decisions can establish, uh, were made and uh, sustained over the whole, over the whole, uh, over the whole era, in regional policy in particular, so is in, in, in economic politics as well. Nothing of the sort in foreign policy area, very cautious, very slow start. And while uh, uh, Putin is now famous for uh, his kind of, priority in foreign policy, his obsession with foreign policy matters, that arrived gradually. Uh, it wasn't his uh, strong card, uh, his, uh, his priority uh, at the very start. He probably recognized his lack of experience in this area. He probably saw his uh, the need to, uh, to, to gain some uh, to, to learn some lessons, to gain some uh, skills. Another uh, was, uh, again, very different, probably unique to foreign policy, is that there's very little of uh, cadre reshuffling. Uh, comparing with, for instance, I don't know, with, with prime minister, how many prime ministers, how sort of unexpected decisions Putin has made during over the years, we see that he's pretty much satisfied and stuck with Lavrov, 
who is now uh, in the rather mature age of kind of 70 plus, and most of his deputies are kind of 60, 60 in the mid 60s, so to say, uh, and very little of change in this area. No, for that matter, no political appointments, and like in, in many other areas, including in the military policy, for that matter. Uh, very, all of them, pretty much all of them are professionals. Uh, career diplomats uh, who are going to uh, proceeding along their uh, professional tracks, which is both a, st a, st a strength and a weakness. It is a strength because they certainly know what the business is about. They have all sort of uh, track record and experience to learn upon, uh, to uh, to put into uh, into play. At the same time. It also means that in this area, people in the key positions are not really in any way a part of Putin's uh, inner circle, so to say, neither the narrow one nor the, larger, uh, the broader one. They are very much outsiders. They are not particularly incorporated in. They are not really a part of the real decision making. Even Lavrov himself. Uh, uh, heavy weight as he is, so to say, in the Russian politics, is very often cut out of, of, of key decisions which are uh, made somewhere else. And the demand for real expertise in those narrow circles is quite limited for what uh, I am able to distinguish. And the third feature, again, unique probably to foreign policy, is that a lot of these decisions are about denials. Uh, and uh, Denials of very different kind, um, and a lot of these denials are about botched operations, events, uh, um, about minor disasters on the lower level. So decisions about, I don't know, shooting down the Boeing was definitely not made in the Kremlin. Uh, I'm not sure about Skripalis. Uh, I'm not sure about you know, Navalny even, where decisions to, you know, to go for this special operations were made, but the decisions to deny, that is high level decision. And with these denials, Putin in fact is taking responsibility for all these kind of blunders on the lower level. Uh, and the denials of the undeniable is a very significant thing which generally under, uh, under, uh, undermines uh, trust in foreign policy matters, which make Putin a very particular kind of, of leader on the high level exchanges who really cannot possibly be trusted. So those are my three uh, very particular features uh, in the foreign policy area. And now the three, uh, so to say, uh, findings, the three key takeaways from the, uh, from this list, from this research, which is still ongoing. And the first one uh, is that the uh, decisions related to uh, building cooperation with the West, with Europe and with the United States, and the decisions related to building up Eurasian integration were never really an alternative. They were always going in parallel. So it wasn't one or another. It was always going along these parallel tracks. Uh, seeking to uh, strengthen cooperation. Uh, and it was a lot of efforts, a lot of decisions in building cooperative ties with, uh, with the West and equally uh, with uh, developing regional integration. And it's in a strange way, both of these tracks came to a stop uh, on the, uh, the year uh, 14 and 15. Uh, again, it, it's fairly obvious that the uh, cooperation with the West uh, hit the wall uh, and the confrontation now is, uh, is the game. So all those efforts involved, invested in building cooperative ties essentially wasted. Uh, but the fact that the, there are no new decisions, there are no new efforts uh, focused on building the Eurasian cooperation, it is a bit counterintuitive because somehow the perception is, instead of this, you're going this way. No, it isn't. Uh, probably Ukraine uh, is a thing which explains this, uh, this failure. 
uh, another kind of major question and an important probably take away from this research is where is the turning point? When exactly uh, the kind of strategic decisions, the mega uh, decision about uh, uh, turning away from cooperation with the West and towards the confrontation, when the West was recognized not just as a um, uh, difficult partner, but as really imminently hostile entity, as an enemy, when that decision uh, was made. And again, it's not obviously a one decision, and very often uh, fingers are pointed towards the Munich speech, and then even more often towards the war with Georgia and the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the confrontation with the West, which happened very soon after. And uh, very obviously, I've mentioned it already before, the year 14, uh, the aggression on Ukraine, annexation of Crimea, uh, that is kind of the third uh, possibility. And what I'm able to see, it's neither of the three. The decision that uh, the West is uh, cannot be uh, a partner in any serious way, but is not more than the competitor, it is an enemy. Uh, for what I am able to distinguish, which can be dated back to the year 12, to Putin's come back to the Kremlin, to the protests in Moscow, which were very much imagined, uh, perceived as manipulated or orchestrated by the West, when suddenly it was a recognition that the West really isn't seeing Putin's return to power as something natural, but there's something very, very really deeply disappointing. Uh, and the kind of reflections on that in the Kremlin, that I see as really a turning point as a kind of mega decision uh, in, this, in this whole list where, uh, where Russia has turned uh, towards the confrontation. And the third, again, very counterintuitive, uh, finding is that I cannot in this list find any uh, any signs of turning away from the kind of cooperation with the West towards the East, towards kind of building and compensating with this confrontation by building strong ties with China. Uh, I don't have full explanation for that. There were certainly decisions in this regard, some of them in the military security area and some of them economic area, like an uh, expert of gas. In the pure foreign policy area, I cannot see decisions that would indicate a serious turn towards the uh, China in particular, Asia Pacific in general. What I can see is a turn towards Middle East very visible and very clear trend from the year 15 since, since the intervention in Syria, all sort of activities, uh, efforts and the investments of political capital in this, uh, in this area. Uh, yes, again, that doesn't take uh, a deep uh, digging into the field to find that. But what is surprising is the lack of, uh, kind of real uh, new connections uh, serious uh, ties with China, and I don't see anything since uh, during this year, since the beginning of pandemic, that would uh, that would disprove that uh, finding. I am yet to to develop a good explanation for that. And so, my bottom line, uh, at least presently, is that yes, it, it it is indeed the case that foreign policy is a major priority for Putin. That he uh, gives it much more attention than to many other uh, areas in decision making, where is he supposed to? Uh, he feels that he that's uh, a game he uh, likes to play, but uh, the, the finding is that he's not really very good at this game. He's not really a gross master of the uh, of the foreign policy in, in intrigues. He is not very successful in this area. Uh, and a lot of efforts uh, are wasted and a lot of decisions uh, turned out to be generally blunders. So yes, a big priority for him. And no, he's not, uh, he's not a master of this game. 
So I'll stop here and I hope I left enough time for discussion. Okay. Hey. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Pavel. Uh, I would invite everybody to put your questions into our chat line, and uh, I'd uh, like to start with a couple of questions uh, to both Tanya and uh, Pavel. In case of internet, uh, it strikes me all the time because uh, this is the sphere where I can't imagine Putin uh, playing the role of a supreme arbiter or major decision maker. Could you please explain or, uh, well, offer any idea about how it works from your point of view? Is there any anybody who uh, can be considered to be Putin's envoy uh, to be the final uh, stage at uh, decision making, if especially there is the conflict between uh, different uh, actors or uh, there are three keys like uh, the scheme which used to work in foreign policy, how does it work uh, from your point of view? And my second question is connected with the most recent changes. Not only we do have the new government where there is the new ministry, which in my view is controlled, uh, not exactly or not only by the prime minister, but uh, by the presidential administration uh, as, as, as well. And so it's, uh, we do see huge uh, activity of the government in terms of uh, establishing coordination center, in terms uh, of establishing center of managing regions and controlling internet and uh, being strongly focused on digitalization. Do you see any uh, new features in uh, decision-making with regard to your sphere which did appear after uh, a regime did start political transformation in 2020. And uh, to panel, uh, uh, well, there is the usual uh, question uh, uh, of the cart and the horse, whether domestic politics defines, shapes foreign policy decisions or vice versa. And we do have the school of thought saying that, well, Putin is uh, not that much focused on domestic politics. It's very dull and not very inspiring for him. Uh, he likes to play geopolitical games, and that's why we do see him being very active in foreign policy decisions and not participating in domestic politics. What's your view on this? Uh, if to look at most recent, say, last uh, several years, foreign policy decisions, are they driven by domestic political considerations? Of course, uh, there is, uh, well, uh, mutual uh, uh, influence, uh, mutual dependence, but how does it work uh, from your point of view? And the second question is uh, pretty much the same. Do you see any uh, influence of political transformation which is going on and which can be somehow described uh, by Putin's uh, distancing from uh, well, making decisions uh, connected to daily management. Do you see any influence of this political transformation starting from uh, January 2020 uh, in the sphere of uh, uh, foreign policy decisions? Okay, Tanya, please, and uh, look uh, at uh, chat line so we are getting uh, new questions. Please, Tanya. Thank you, Nikolai. Thanks. Those are both really interesting questions. Um, I think in terms of Vladimir Putin's own interest in or connection to making decisions about the internet, um, I, I, I still think he's largely not really interested in the internet itself and as, as kind of an object. And I think he doesn't probably doesn't spend much time thinking about it. I think he always sees the internet through whatever the dominant frame was or is at the time. It's like, what does it do? Um, I think ver very early on, even probably in 1999, when he was just um, just appointed prime minister, he was actually quite enthusiastic about the Internet. Um, and uh, in one of his public statements, he said the Internet is a very promising form of communication. But after that, he kind of forgot about it. And it wasn't really until much later, around you know, 2012, when we started to talk about the Internet as a, as a political sphere and as a political tool. And at the same time, we started also having conversations about morals and values and traditional values so the cultural moral side of the equation when he gained a sort of renewed interest and it was more of a negative interest so i think depending on the period 
probably the people who shaped his understanding or helped make decisions um, about what to do with the internet were really those people who were, you know, ahead of those dominant narratives. So early on, there was probably quite a bit of um, kind of a bit of technocratic or, you know, this sort of cyber optimism looking at the internet's role in education, whereas later on it was very much influenced by um, the sort of traditionalists in, um, in at the top of the Russian state. So, um, you know, perhaps even uh, Putin's chef um, or a few other people who have those connections to the Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox church, I think heavily shaped this focus on the internet as a place where there's pornography and nothing good will come of it, or it's also a place that various um, alternative actors use to, to undermine uh, the, ruling, the ruling party and the, the people in power. So I think, you know, it probably at the time of say 2014, 2013, um, I would be fairly positive that his view was probably shaped quite a lot by um, Surkov, who, you know, is extremely online as, as the youth like to say, um, and who, uh, you know, has a, a lot of opinions about how the internet is useful or not useful. And it's quite, those opinions are quite cynical, but also on the other hand, by the traditionalists, um, you know, like uh, even the the leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church, but also all the all the friendly um, people in in the parliament and and in in various government positions. And I would say that has that is still there, but it has largely been replaced by this pervasive um, rhetoric of the internet as a tool of and a, and a place where. Um, geopolitics and national security uh, are now at the forefront, and therefore, it is largely the you know the the sort of the the hawks and and the seal of the key who are shaping I think now the agenda um, up to and including the way the internet sovereignty law has been shaped and has formed, um, and at the same time promoting this rhetoric of well the Russian internet is a separate beast and it must be protected at all costs because we don't want anything to do with that other internet which is a CIA project and we seek to protect ourselves from this. Um, so so the, that's why we now have you know, uh, continued interest in digital development and using all sorts of digital innovations inside Russia while also trying to build, um, build some kind of barrier and to, to protect from external threats, however real or, or not real they are. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, with, with the new government, um, we, are, we really are seeing the internet becoming part of the mainstream agenda in the sense that it's, it's seen more like, um, you know, part of everyday life rather than some kind of weird, strange sphere that is parallel and <laughs> that is a virtual reality. It is now, you know, seen in, in the same as as a resource, really, um, as a resource, you know, like oil or, um, you know, or or whatever else you might think of as as kind of something that needs, um, you know, that we need to solidify federal control over or you know centralized control over, and that you know we need to develop some rules and lay down the groundwork, which everybody will comply with. Um, so, you know, it, it is really seen as more of just a typical typical resource that needs to be tightly controlled and as a strategic resource. So I think that has very much been the shift for me, um, especially in the past couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Pavel, please. Yes, I, I hope I have unmuted myself successfully. Yes. Uh, yes, the question about interplay uh, interdependency between foreign policy and domestic policy is certainly a very interesting one. And uh, from my research here, I can have only one side of this, uh, of this dilemma, so to say, of this interplay. So it cannot be a convincing answer. Uh, it, you need to analyze both sides to uh, arrive to a solid conclusion. From what I am able to see is that we have... Uh, a very clear kind of break of direction, because uh, in the in the first so to say decade, even longer for uh, uh, Putin's era, so to say, we see a lot of decisions in the foreign policy area aimed, designed to uh, to help to stimulate to uh, increase Russia's uh, economic uh, development. Uh, that to in, uh, attract foreign investors, to 
go for kind of joint ventures to, to, to try to build up some positive um, Russian image in, in the world with that in mind, that Russia would uh, regain uh, momentum in foreign policy in a, in a positive way. And that would uh, help its internal development. That would uh, uh, help acceleration of, of growth and uh, growth of prosperity and so on and so on. And that's no longer the case. And the, the break is going to be very obvious somewhere in the, not probably before already the uh, aggression against Ukraine that suddenly this is no longer uh, a relevant uh, factor at all, that uh, a lot of foreign policy decisions have the immediate consequence that it will hurt Russian uh, economic development, that is detrimental for uh, in many ways. And this price is accepted as, in kind of, as, a, as a part of the necessary um, drive of the foreign policy in a very uh, in a very different direction and at the same time probably in parallel we see that the resources available for foreign policy are shrinking that uh, it's less and less possible for, you know, for Russia to put not just words and uh, networking uh, and some uh, hybrid means behind this foreign policy, but to put something material. And we see that very clearly, for instance, in Syria, where the key question now uh, is post for reconstruction. And Russia cannot do it. Russia cannot invest in that. And that causes all sorts of uh, particular foreign policy problems, like, for instance, the ongoing uh, discussion in the UN Security Council about the humanitarian uh, corridors to Syria. Uh, which or the outcome we will learn in a, in a couple of days. Um, so that shortage of resources for in support of foreign policy is increasing and uh, will be set to increase further because Russian economic uh, posture is not getting any, any better and foreign policy doesn't help with that at all. Your second question about the changes uh, in the last few uh, couple of years, and again, you know, where at least a, a part of that is already beyond my data, so to say. Uh, the most recent things uh, uh, are not in my, uh, in my list. But uh, it is very distinguishable that Putin's protracted self-isolation because of the uh, epidemic has impacted the uh, quality of decision-making in the foreign policy area. Uh, generally, much more cautious and reserved much less uh, proactive and inclined to play white as we see uh, in the year, in the few year, years before. Um, again, maybe that will change, but we see much more responses to uh, external challenges than necessary. Kind of, you have to do something about that, like, I don't know, in the Caucasus, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Very, kind of, cautious, reluctant even uh, approach to that uh, very acute challenge. Uh, the decision which was going to be made in the end isn't a bad decision. It's probably the, uh, a remarkably balanced and again, uh, pretty cautious. Uh, is not a solution to the situation at all and leaves uh, many uh, parties to the conflict and uh, you know, other parties dissatisfied, but nevertheless, it's a typical case. And in, the, in this sense, kind of response to Biden's initiative on the summit and the approach to the uh, Geneva summit is another case here. Uh, fairly reserved, fairly cautious. Uh, I'm not sure whether it will last because I am not really a big believer in Biden's argument about stable and predictable policy. I don't think it's going to uh, it's going to work simply because on the, as long as Russia stays on this track of uh, stable and predictable, it is a designated loser. Uh, in many foreign policy uh, games. And uh, it's too obvious, I think, for many in the Kremlin and for Putin himself. Uh, but nevertheless, that's kind of the uh, feature which is kind of noticeable in the most recent, uh, in the most recent part of the, of this research project. Thank you. Well, have you seen the question uh, which came from Dmitry? 
on China. Yeah, look at it, please. And uh, let me ask the question, uh, which is the same for both of you. Uh, and uh, I think it will be interesting for majority of our participants. There is the area where your spheres do overlap. And this is, of course, cybersecurity. So uh, uh, could you please elaborate a little bit more, Tanya and uh, Pavel? This is very instrumental. This is how internet can be used uh, in terms of foreign policy or even uh, military uh, politics. Could you please elaborate a little bit more how it looks from your point of view? Is it just a separate sphere and what's going on there? is uh, absolutely different from what's going on in uh, the rest of internet sphere and it's hidden we don't know how decisions are made there how uh, and what uh, uh, actors do participate in uh, making these decisions and uh, for Pavel uh, the same uh, how do you see this and uh, is it different from uh, majority of your foreign policy decisions or it's uh, the same and the logics behind uh, it is similar to what you've described. Tanya, please. I think cybersecurity is probably one of the more interesting arenas from the point of view of you know, looking at how decisions are made about the internet because obviously cybersecurity doesn't just touch on the Russian internet but it also looks at the internet more globally and um, you know, at Russia's engagement kind of in, 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 in the global arena. Um, and I think here, as in probably a lot of other um, spheres of, of how Russia makes decisions, there are, there's kind of the visible and formal layer, and then there's the, the more invisible and a lot less formal layer. So there's, there's things happening at both of those levels. I mean, on, on the uh, very visible and formal layer, we know that Russia has a lot of um, different uh, collaborative agreements with multiple countries, including on the one hand, China, and on the other hand, we know that even during his most recent meeting with uh, Joe Biden, Putin, one of the things that both countries said they formally discussed was cybersecurity, uh, and specifically, you know, cyber attacks and um, ransomware attacks, um, and they agreed that they would, that would be one of the things that they would sort of prioritize in, in their relationship going forward, despite all of the difficulties. At the same time, Given what we know about, um, you know, how Russia is really concerned about its own cybersecurity as part of, part of the kind of sovereignty um, frame, and that it actually uses cybersecurity as a pretext for a lot of the decisions, even though they may not necessarily always be purely for reasons of cybersecurity, um, that that you know it it does kind of say that yes we're we're doing all these things we're taking over infrastructure we're consolidating control to protect um the russian internet on the other hand they're a lot less public and a lot less we know a lot less about um how russia itself engages in um testing cybersecurity defenses of other countries um, because a lot of their engagement on on that level happens uh, rather informally, and very often it happens through actors who aren't necessarily uh, formally integrated into certain security or foreign intelligence or, you know, like the, these are not people who necessarily have titles, um, but we, we know them as kind of those hybrid actors uh, who, you know, some investigative journalists have dug up some information about them and have traced them back to particular intelligence um, offices uh, or sections, but we don't necessarily know exactly how many people work in those offices or what it is they do. Um, and so I think, and I think Russia prefers it that way, you know, to, to have those kind of semi-formal um, actors involved, whether or not they're actually employed by uh, the Russian state or by the Russian military or foreign intelligence, or if they're just contractors. Right, because it really helps with plausible deniability in case, um, you know, in case something happens that makes Russia look bad, um, which is why it's causing such, uh, you know, such difficulties uh, with attribution uh, of who is behind particular attacks. But I think declaratively, like Russia is, is very much in favor of establishing an image of a country that cares a lot about cybersecurity, has some really nice um, knowledge and expertise in the area and is willing to work with other states. Um, 
I think that that is the image at least it wants to to promote and maybe Pavel will will add uh, something here as well. Okay, Pavel, please. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, okay, I hope again I have unmuted myself successfully. And certainly the uh, cybersecurity is a particular area. There is an overlap with foreign policy, uh, and it's a peculiar one. I would say for quite a long time already. Uh, Russia is really trying to uh, present itself on the international arena as uh, as a country which is very much in favor of uh, enforcing rules and regulations, of making this sphere more uh, regulated, better controlled, and all these efforts are going nowhere. So it's in many ways all this Russian uh, discourse about. Uh, um, making internet better regulated is a failure. Uh, much the same way as attempts for a long time to make an effect, effective control over the cyber, over the internet uh, inside Russia is also a failure. Uh, and I think significantly uh, it is uh, a result of the colossal dynamism in this area and uh, kind of understanding in the Russian leadership of what this whole thing is about is always lagging behind. Uh, the picture in the heads of what internet really is uh, doesn't really describe where this sphere is uh, presently um, uh, is situated. And uh, I think we are not seeing any catching up. And another thing is that in the foreign policy area, we have a huge centralization of decision making, uh, incredible concentration of power in the in the very narrow circle around Putin, so that even Lavrov is not a part of that. While in the internet area, we have a different situation. It is really widely decentralized. It is, there are all sort of kind of actors and initiatives there, and all sort of kind of uh, groupings and particular actors who are feeling free to go to pursue their interests. I am not sure that GRU uh, is really following strict orders from the Kremlin in, in uh, going for their special operations. Uh, and I'm not sure that the, in this regard, the, the agreement reached in Geneva between Putin and Biden to finally establish uh, a channel of communication in the cyber sphere, something which Russia tried to advocate for a long time, uh, finally agreed, will yield any result. Uh, and probably the cyber attacks by this uh, group of hackers, uh, widely believed to be based in Russia, uh, which is still ongoing as we speak, uh, is a pr proof positive of that. Uh, the Russian leadership doesn't really have a doesn't really have a good clue about what is uh, what is going on in this uh, in this area, and all the ideas that we need to uh, use the experience uh, developed by China, we need to somehow take that as a model. Uh, it's not really working. Uh, the Russia really cannot for, uh, put that uh, model uh, applied to its own reality. Now that leads me to the question raised by Dmitry about going deeper into the very specific uh, point I'm making about about a lack of evidence of the turn to uh, to China in foreign policy, and uh, in the chat. Uh, and he mentions that there is some increase in economic cooperation and in military security ties. And I have to say that as far as uh, arms sales for that matter is concerned, it is a very particular area. It doesn't quite uh, belong to foreign policy, so to say. It's a different department. It's not, uh, it's not Lavrov who is, uh, so to say, an actor there. But it is very visible uh, that the decision to increase arms export to China, to sell its most modern arms uh, in the year 16 and 17, has no uh, follow up. Yes, the S-14 two batteries were sold and uh, a squadron of modern fighters was sold and that was it. We don't have any, um, any uh, follow-up on that. 
again, a particular area probably needs more digging in, but China is no longer an important market for, uh, for Russian arms, despite all the pledges of cooperation. Different stories, certainly, with the economic cooperation, in particular the export of uh, hydrocarbons and oil and gas, which indeed uh, is a foreign policy instrument and also a very, very particular area. It more belongs to energy policy than to foreign policy, despite instrumentalization and even to say weaponization of, uh, of uh, the gas export. And here we also see that, yes, the decisions were made by on the year, already on the year 14 about this uh, gas pipeline to Sibiri, and Putin wanted the second one and didn't get it. it the decision wasn't really uh, uh, made. China doesn't want the second pipeline. China opted to put some money into the Yamal LNG project uh, and it's kind of it's, it's going on with the uh, with this kind of rescue uh, package from China, but again, uh, LNG goes mostly to the European market. For what I understand, some of it goes to to, to Asia Pacific. In the big picture of kind of Chinese energy policy, it's an it's a minuscule thing uh, for Russia. It is an important development, but. Uh, Again, here different actors are involved. It's much more Novatek and the private owners of that thing than the uh, foreign policy establishment. In specifically in the foreign policy area, I cannot really find uh, evidence of any significant turn to the to the east. And, and by the way, how the uh, treaty Russia has with China, uh, which was come which was coming to an expiration and need to be renewed, how it was done this year, kind of virtually by kind of a, a very brief uh, formal ceremony, doesn't really show much of uh, uh, evidence uh, for strengthening uh, of partnership between Russia and China. It looks like for China, kind of this partnership uh, is something uh, very uh, secondary uh, comparing to the great uh, importance it attaches to the celebrating of the hundred year of this communist party and all the brouhaha around that and there were some, uh, some very pro forma very secondary uh, connections in russian direction in this regard but not really of any of any significance and probably it's also related to the fact China is placing great emphasis on its particular brand of communism. Uh, and in Russia, communism as such isn't really uh, what Putin is, uh, is building, what he is, uh, uh, what he is doing. So uh, maybe I need to dig deeper in this case and provide better explanations for uh, for this finding. Maybe I will uh, have to uh, make it softer, but I wanted to kind of strengthen this uh, this point in this presentation because I think it's in many ways it's counterintuitive. Okay, thank you, Pavel. There is one more question which came uh, from the Mithilus and Ramuza, and I'd like to add uh, another one which comes to both uh, you and Tanya. And uh, it's about, uh, it's it's very general one. So when uh, describing how decisions are made in different spheres, uh, we are speaking about poor expertise, lack of public discussion and secrecy, uh, lack of meritocracy. But nevertheless, at the end, we do have decisions which, uh, well, look uh, more or less competitive. So what, uh, uh, first of all, uh, could you please mention any mistakes in your spheres which are reflected as mistakes by the system itself and uh, which uh, have been revised uh, later? And second, how would you explain, uh, having in mind all these problems and restrictions, uh, how uh, uh, well uh, the system is capable uh, to be sustainable and not to make any serious mistakes when making all these decisions. So, Tanya, please. That, that's that's the question, right? I mean, I think I've, I've as I mentioned in in uh, my brief 
presentation earlier, very often there is some competency, but it's not always with those who end up making the final decision or shaping the final text of the draft bill, for instance. And so very often the mistakes are where, you know, you have a list of amendments that are made, um, but it's uh, not clear, for instance, uh, where the funding for them will come for, for, for the activities that they um, mandate will come from. Um, and so very often the mistakes are either corrected at draft level where the draft gets sent back and it's then uh, corrected by other actors who are more competent in say the budgeting uh, sphere and then it's sent back or um, if the draft was rushed through um, as as was with with the second and, and uh, final draft of the internet sovereignty bill like the issue there was you know the ministry of finance was like well this is a lot of money that you're asking for to fund all of these changes. Where is it going to come from? And in, eventually it was established that part of it would come from funding that was already allocated to the digital development program and then other funding would be found elsewhere. So, um, so very often I think it's, it's the declarative nature of these decisions that dominates and you know, they are uh, passed, voted on, presented to the public, and then the implementation gets sort of swept under the rug. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the very detailed bits of implementation of the internet sovereignty legislation are still like they're not entirely resolved. So you know, a lot of the internet service providers, especially the really regional ones that have fewer um, resources, have yet to install the equipment. But nobody likes to talk about that. So those those things kind of. Um, you know, remain out, out, out of the public eye. And it's only when digital rights activists or independent journalists dig them up and, and report on them that the conversation uh, renews and then maybe some further correctives are applied. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, at, at this point, it, it's, um, I don't think it's anything new necessarily for how uh, decisions are made in Russia. And I think also that the internet isn't exclusively the domain where such mistakes are made, uh, you know, uh, where the declarative nature of the decision doesn't quite gel with the implementation or the amount of resources that are available. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Pavel, please. Yes, there are also a couple of questions to me in the chat. Uh, and one is probably not only to me, but probably more to you, Kole, about publishing our research. Uh, it is a big project uh, with many uh, participants and my draft chapter is a part of that. I am not publishing it anywhere else because it would be somehow uh, it means spoiling the effect of our big, uh, big collective effort. Uh, but I will be glad to share uh, my my drafts uh, with anybody if uh, if the, if there is interest. Second question is about the private military companies. Uh, Wagner's of uh, various kinds, so to say. Uh, name has become really a cliche uh, foreign policy. I think generally they are much more a part of the very particular kind of Russian military interventionism, uh, which is a focus of research of uh, Dmitry Gorin's work in, in this project. And uh, it is clear that uh, Russian foreign policy, so to say, establishment uh, from Lavrov down uh, has little to do with them. Even in Syria, where the whole thing started, it's very clear that Russian foreign policy is doing one thing and Russian military are doing another thing. Connection between the two is not very good. And if Russian foreign policy is doing the Astana process and many other things, and Russian military are doing intervention on the ground, and there is not a great coordination between these two uh, these two policies, and that's probably why the Astana is in complete uh, uh, deadlock. So I will probably will leave uh, aside the private military contracts. The topic is of great interest for me, but I cannot. So they put all my interests in the very particular and I think very innovative uh, framework which this project uh, offers. Uh, now to the question about learning and about mistakes, learning from mistakes, because this is uh, system capacity of learning. There are a few uh, decisions which can easily be recognized as mistake. 
uh, only a few. One of them, for instance, was the uh, plan uh, known as Cossack plan for the uh, uh, settlement of the conflict in Moldova. Backfired immediately, so easy to see how it was a mistake. There are some kind of other uh, decisions which can probably be uh, in hindsight seen as mistakes. For instance, rec uh, recognition of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia as independent states, so to say, uh, was really a, a blunder. Uh, didn't strengthen in any way uh, Russian uh, positions in the South Caucasus, Russian uh, reputation uh, in broader sense, didn't really work, so to say, uh, and created for Russia more problems than, uh, than uh, bonuses. And that's very typical that Russia has to persist with that. Learning from these mistakes is very difficult uh, because of the nature of these mistakes. And I think that is particularly the case with uh, uh, decisions related to denials. Very difficult to reverse without a loss of face. And I think Boeing probably uh, over Donbass uh, is, the, uh, is the best example of that. Uh, every evidence is presented, the court cases are pro uh, progressing, and there is still a denial and no way out of that self-made trap and no learning from that. And I think basically the uh, evolution, so to say, the mutation of the system of power uh, which Russia now has, uh, and it's not the same Putin regime we had in the previous decade, we had at the beginning of 2010s, uh, we, and we have now, the system is changing. And it's changing in such a way uh, that its ability to learn is diminishing, uh, that the decider is becoming so full of uh, himself, so convinced in his great uh, ability to uh, mastermind every, uh, every situation, that the capacity to learn that the critical voices, that the kind of real uh, discussions uh, inside the uh, very small decision-making circle is getting worse, not better that the demand for expertise is diminishing. So I think the quality of decisions in generally in foreign policy in particular uh, is deteriorating. And that is um, something I will try to uh, prove with more evidence, but it is a trend which is very quickly developing. And uh, probably before our project will come to fruition, we will have, uh, I'm afraid, more uh, more evidence of that. And uh, what worries me is how the whole uh, uh, compromise, so to say, how the whole understanding uh, achieved at Geneva will erode and, uh, and break down and what might come out of that. Thank you. Thank Nikolai, you so could much, I, could Tanya, I add, please. yeah, just because sure. uh, this sort of came to mind while Pavel was talking, and I think uh, uh, this is also something we've grappled with in our larger project is, you know, the, the fact that it's infuriatingly difficult to find out how decisions are made because we have so little information. And I think that also plays into the hands of those who potentially are making mistakes because, well, you know, if even if the mistake becomes public, it's still not particularly clear who made a particular decision or who is to blame. So there's always capacity there to, to shift the blame onto somebody less, um, you know, less prominent uh, and less important. And because we know so little, it's, it's much easier to manipulate the situation and manipulate the public opinion. I mean, I, I think a good example of this was also, you know, the situation with blocking Telegram where very quickly became available, uh, became clear that it didn't work, it was a mistake, and it actually brought more public um, outcry and negative reaction from across the board. But it took so long for Roscoe Mazor and for, for those above them who made the decision to block Telegram to actually admit that it didn't work and that they made a mistake and that they wouldn't be blocking telegram any longer like it took them a year and a half almost if not more to to acknowledge this 
But then they twisted it further. And instead of acknowledging that they made a mistake, they said, oh, well, now we reached an understanding with Telegram, but it didn't give any details whatsoever of what that understanding was. And Telegram denies it. But Telegram also isn't really great at revealing what's going on behind the scenes. So we still don't know whether there was any understanding reached or whether they're both lying or one of them is lying. And that really plays into the hands of those making decisions and making mistakes. Okay, thank you so much. I think that uh, this is very good positive note, which leaves some hopes and we can uh, end on this uh, wonderful note. Let me thank our both presenters, Tanya Lockett and Paolo Wife. And uh, let me thank also all participants. I think it's extremely important uh, for us when moving forward with this uh, project, not only to discuss preliminary results, but to get feedback and to answer uh, questions. And uh, uh, I would invite you to uh, ask uh, questions if any uh, by mail uh, after the end of our uh, today's discussion. And with saying this, I'd like to thank uh, all of you and uh, uh, to say to say goodbye. Thank, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll see you next time, perhaps, uh, at the fall after the break. Thank you.